welcome to this episode of Audio Basics. Today we'll be continuing our series on what makes a stereo good, and we're going to cover today the next three topics in our top 10 list of sound quality concepts. If you'll remember, or if you watched uh, episode two, which I highly recommend, we covered frequency response, and we covered that in three different ways. So we covered frequency response in terms of balance. Bass, midrange, and treble are at approximately equal levels so that the sound is balanced, is what we say. Smoothness, the frequencies within each range, within the bass range, within the mid range, and within the treble area are approximately equal instead of being peaky and peaks and valleys. Uh, and we'll put some images on the screen to help you visualize this. And then we talked about frequency response in terms of range. We want to be able to reproduce low frequencies and uh, high frequencies and cover approximately the full range of human hearing, which as we said is classically considered to be 20 hertz in the bass to 20,000 hertz in the treble. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more in a second about uh, how that actually works. But let me start by reviewing what we said about frequency because it's a really important thing for you to know and I wanted to pull a few extra facts together to kind of flesh out what we talked about last time. So we said, uh, we talked about bass and mid-range and treble, but I think I didn't really cover what those ranges are and there's not a precise definition, but an easy way to think about this is bass is roughly 20 to 400 hertz. Mid-range is roughly 500 to about 4,000 hertz, maybe 3,000 hertz. And treble is from three or 4,000 hertz up to 20,000 hertz. So 20 to 400, 500 to, let's say, 3,000 and 4,000 to 20,000 for the treble. And just to illustrate using actual instruments, because it's kind of hard to imagine, uh, what is 383 hertz? But I pointed out that you can use real musical instruments to get some familiarity with this. Uh, I checked my facts because I wanted to go beyond the piano keyboard, but you'll remember from last time that low A on a piano, that's the leftmost key on an 88 key keyboard, is 27.5 hertz. And we talked about Stanley Clark, and low E on a traditional bass guitar would be tuned to 41 hertz. So if I said bass starts in the 20 to 40 hertz range, you can understand that I'm talking about as low as instruments that we typically think of as having real bass go. 27 hertz, 41 hertz, that's, that's kind of where the bass starts. Middle C on a piano is 256 hertz. So we still haven't gotten very high and we're already to middle C on a piano. And then the top, the right hand most key on a piano keyboard is at 4,186, 4,186 hertz. So suddenly we seem to have gotten a lot higher, but a piano keyboard has a very wide range from very low bass to very high. I can't even go that high, very high treble. Uh, so that gives you an idea. Just though to round this out, uh, the high string on a typical six string guitar, that's E, an open E, which is not as high as the guitar can go because you can fret all the way down, well, 
that you can see some guys playing like all the way down to the sound hole uh, or almost to the sound hole. Uh, but open E, so unfretted E, high E on a guitar is tuned to 330 hertz. So you can see that a lot of these instruments are tuned to what seem like bass or mid-range kinds of frequencies. For another context, one we'll all be familiar with is the female voice predominantly occurs in the range from 400 to 4,000 hertz, pretty much aligned with what I called the mid-range. The male voice, you all know, male voices tend to be lower, and the male voice primarily occurs in the range from about 250 hertz, mid, mid to upper bass, to 1,250 hertz. That doesn't mean the female and male voices can't go lower or higher, and there are variations between humans and all of uh, that stuff, but that gives you a rough idea of where much of what you're used to hearing from female voice, 400 to 4,000, male voice, you know, 250 to 1,250 hertz. That's most of... Uh, but with that being said, if like Ariana Grande can hit 4,000 range, yep. um, you just described those instruments, the high keys on the piano, why would anybody want to get a, a system that could get up to 20,000? Like bass, I understand if the human ear can hear these low frequencies, but bass you can actually feel. So even if you can get lower, it's like, cool, I can, I can feel it. But the high is this like yep. subliminal wow. messaging. They're like, what's yep. going on? If we can't even technically hear that. Yep. So uh, it's a really good question. And I want to give a simple explanation because there we could get into some physics and that would probably be confusing and I might even confuse myself. So <laughs> let's just not go there. But the basic answer to your question is something we call overtones. I mentioned it last time, but let me say it again. The character of a musical instrument is defined largely by its overtones. And what we mean is when you take anything, this wood, that, and you can hear some of the metal vibrating mm. too, but like, well, that doesn't do much, <laughs> right? Of course, but in your head, which is pretty yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Right? Dong. Yeah. Uh, but these, uh, materials and the shape of the materials have different resonant properties. They resonate when we strike them, or in the case of stringed instruments, when strat, we strat them. Strat versus Les Paul. It's completely. Right. It's the wood. It's the tone. It's partially the wood. It's some. Of course, electronics too. Strings. Yep, we could go into exactly. all kinds of detail, but the wood but, does make a massive. But the materials tone. have different resonant characteristics, and when we're talking about resonance, we're talking about overtones. So if we took two instruments that were both tuned, the string and a piano that was tuned to 440 hertz, let's say, and, the string and, and a string and a guitar tuned to 440, if there were such a tuning, I don't think there is, but let's say there was, right? Two instruments tuned to 440 hertz. You know darn well that if we got a guitar out and plucked that string that's tuned to 440, and then I press the key on the piano that's tuned to 440. No they sound so. completely different. Mm -hmm. That's because the character, what sometimes is called the timbre of the instrument is controlled by its overtones and the way a string resonates when it's plucked, guitar, mm -hmm. and a string resonates when it's hit by a hammer, piano, and a drum head sounds when it's hit by a stick, those have different resonant characteristics that are characterized by their overtone signature. How much of the second harmonic, two times the fundamental frequency, third harmonic, fourth harmonic, fifth harmonic, sixth harmonic, how much do they have? How much does the body of the guitar resonate? Now the body of a guitar is maybe this big, 
uh, Steinway Grand is yeah, bigger than this that. table. Exactly. The Steinway is going to have a different characteristic body sound than, uh, you know, a uh, Martin Dreadnought guitar is going to have, and a Martin Dreadnought's going to have a different uh, sound than uh, Taylor does, and uh, Strat's going to have different resonant characteristics than a Les Paul, and on and on and on. And all of those resonant characteristics are uh, captured in the overtone signature, the multiples of that fundamental resonant frequency. But you're saying those overtones are higher than 4,000? They're like multiples. The, okay. An overtone is called an overtone because it's a multiple of the fundamental. So now let's take, for example, on a piano, middle C is 256 hertz, but the second harmonic is going to be at 512. And the fourth harmonic, the math is a little easier for me, mm -hmm. is going to be at 1024. And the uh, eighth harmonic is going to be at 2000 hertz. Okay, great. We didn't get very high yet. But now what about when I take the so high I see key? it's 2x. Or so I, I'm like... It's, it's 10, 2x, 3x, 4x, okay. 5x, 6x. Okay. Right? So if you do 6x, the 4000 hertz on the top of the piano keyboard, right? You're going to be at 24,000 hertz. Mm -hmm. Oh, wait. But can the human ear, we can actually decipher that. So that's we what it... don't usually ask the stereo to reproduce more than 20,000 hertz because it's commonly said we can't hear it. There is some thinking that we can, uh, and we can go into that at a later date. But if we just roll with the basics, what we're talking about here, we say we can hear to 20,000 hertz, but I think I just showed you to hear the overtones of the high frequencies on a piano, you need to go higher than 20,000 hertz, right? Mm -hmm. Because the, the six times multiple of 4,000 hertz is 24,000, which is above 20. And there's lots of overtones. So now we go back to Ariana Grande, right? Mm -hmm. If she can sing, I don't even know what the note is, but if she can sing 4,000 hertz, which I guarantee you she can, right? Mm -hmm. Her overtones are at eight, 12, 16, 20, 24, and that characterizes the sound of her voice. And sometimes the reason a singer has a particularly beautiful voice is because their overtone signature is really, really full of harmonics that are pleasant. And generally we think of, this is an aside, but generally we think of the even harmonics as sounding pleasing and the odd harmonics as being a little more edgy sounding. Again, we maybe so a with, later date could go into that, but you get quick, the idea. Without going too far off topic here, a, a good stereo, okay, we gotta definitely put some oil on this chair, but uh, <laughs> 200 to 20,000, is 20 it? 20 to 20,000. Okay, 20 to 20,000. When we get into the extreme high-end game, are there stereos that go to like 40? Or it's just? Yes. Yes. Okay. So there I'm sure are, we'll learn about just that to take road, an example, okay. and there are various reasons for this, but there are amplifiers that go into the megahertz region. And you might say that's insane and that doesn't make any difference, but uh, hopefully in like episode 38, we'll talk about why it might. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Cool. Yep. Now I'm going to talk about a thing that's related to this, and this therefore is a very good lead-in. So I think we've done a reasonable job summarizing and fleshing out some of what we talked about with frequency response the last time. Uh, but this is actually this issue of overtones that Lance brought up, genius that Lance <laughs> yeah. is. Uh, Genius is genius, whether it's accidental or <laughs> premeditated. Anyway, uh, we're going to talk about some sound quality factors that are related to this issue of overtones, but they show up in how we hear music being reproduced in a little bit different way. So the topic we're going to go over today is something that's called sound staging. I mentioned this in episode one. I want to go into it in a little more depth 
today. So if you remember what we said in episode two at the beginning, the way we're basically judging a stereo system is whether it accurately reproduces the original sound of musicians in a real space. We called that, you remember, the absolute sound, and we said we wanted to have high fidelity to the absolute sound. Mm -hmm. If what we like is music, and we believe the artist had a great vision for what he was doing, and God knows Hendrix did, and the Clash did, and Stanley did, and I'll even say Haydn did. Mm -hmm. I have my doubts about Mozart, but hey, <laughs> no hate. Mozart too. Okay. Uh, they all had a vision, and they're trying to communicate something with that vision, and we want to reproduce it accurately, and they sweated the details, and we want the details reproduced the way they wanted us to hear them, because we, we want to know what they were trying to communicate. Mm -hmm. Right? Makes sense. So we care about the absolute sound, and we care about fidelity to the absolute sound. Okay, so now let's imagine that we're recording a performance that's done live. Doesn't have to be done live, but it's easy to imagine this, right? There are musicians up on stage. And one of the things we care about in terms of sound quality is something we call sound staging, sound staging. So we say from a sound reproduction standpoint, there is a sound stage that's being reproduced. And as I pointed out originally, you can imagine a classical rock and roll arrangement where the bass player is on the left and the lead guitarist is on the right and the drums are in the back and the lead vocalist is in the center and I don't know, there are various arrangements of this, but if there are keyboards, maybe the keyboards are, you know, between stage left and uh, center, between the bass guitar and the uh, drummer. Let's just say that's the arrangement. Mm -hmm. Sound staging is us asking the question, how well does the stereo reproduce the sense of the space that the performers are in. So an obvious thing would be like, does the bass guitar sound like it's on the left and does the lead guitar sound like it's on the right? But if you go to a live concert, you'll notice that the uh, precision of the location of the performance isn't as like, you know, 36.2 degrees right like that. They're on the right side and there's a sense of space around them. So an easy way to think about judging soundstage quality is to ask ourselves, first of all, is the width of the soundstage realistic? Does it sound like, oh, there are these performers and the bass is on the left and the guitar is on the right and the drums are in the middle, but the performers seem to be on this like tiny desktop. Well, that's not how it really sounds when you go to a live performance. So we want to know, is the soundstage width appropriate to the kind of performance? We would like it to be appropriately wide. So if it's jazz performers recorded in a club, it shouldn't sound like it's in a Soldier Field in Chicago, where some performances take place. But it's a really different kind of uh, acoustic environment, and it's a really different feeling of the size of the sound. You know, the Grateful Dead, when they were running, I don't even know what the specs on their equipment were, but you know, 150 speakers and 29 amplifiers, and it's wall of sound time, right? Mm -hmm. That's very different than a singer-songwriter performing solo on stage. There will still be, still be a sense of space, but that sense of space should be appropriate, and the first dimension of that is the width should feel appropriate because we have a stereo system 
and the stereo system has a left speaker and a right speaker to be able to present some concept of stage width. And we want the whole system to reproduce that signal accurately by placing instrumentalists where they are with a sense of appropriate width. There are a million reasons that's not that easy to do, but that's what we want. So soundstage width is characteristic number one that we're looking for. So you can see that we're kind of going through a three-dimensional model of the soundstage, the space, the representation of space in which music is performed. So if you think about a 3D model, so the second element of sound staging that we're going to talk about is sound stage depth. And you might not think about that normally, but this is fundamental in the experience of audiophiles in being able to create a sense of the music being performed in a real space. If you, particularly classical music people, will know that when you go to hear an orchestra in a hall, there's quite a bit of reverberation and you just have the sense, and the ear is very good at this for reasons that relate to evolution, uh, the ear is very good at being able to pick up on the space in which the sound is created. And that's done through picking up on reverberation because you know if Lance says something and the reverberation time is very long, the ear knows, you don't even have to think about this, the ear knows that he's in a large space because you don't get long reverberation times. Think of a gymnasium versus being in your bathroom. You have short reverb times in your bathroom because it's small, the sound doesn't have to travel very far, and you know your brain is built to know this because out on the savanna, when you could be chased down by a cheetah, you needed to know when you heard a sound, you needed to have an idea of how far away it was and what the location was and all sorts of sure. interesting stuff. Anyway, so you can sense that reverb time as a sense of just your head builds a model of the space in which the music is being performed. And you might ask yourself, well, how exactly is that done? And without getting into the inner ear and how the brain processes, it, processes the musical information, the one of the big things is that those overtones we talked about before, the fundamental, yes, you hear the reverberation of that, but you also hear the decay of the sounds at higher and higher and higher frequencies, and the reverberation of that tells your ear-brain combination quite a bit about the space in which things are being performed. So. We will talk in the next episode about resolution and noise floor, but there's a reason that we want to hear those overtones. And part of it is because we want to hear the timbre of Ariana Grande's voice or the sound of a Bosendorfer that the classical pianist is playing on. We want to hear the beautiful tone and we need that overtone signature. But the other reason we want to hear those overtones is those overtones at different frequencies fill out our sense of the space in which the music is being performed. And often that spaciousness is just really a beautiful thing. And it's particularly beautiful in being able to get a sense of depth, mm -hmm. the deepness and the richness of the hall. And then exactly parallel to the idea of depth, is the notion of height. So we would like to have some sense of the height of the music being reproduced matching what it would be like in a live performance. Now you might reasonably ask, 
wait a second, we've only got two speakers here and there's nothing up there, how are we reproducing height? And some of that is through the recording, capturing the reflections off of the ceiling or off of the back wall and those reflections being reproduced very well by the stereo. There are multi-channel systems that have height speakers. That's another way to do it. And in episode 97, we may get to that stuff, but it is impressive the degree to which capturing in the recording of two channels, the reflections off of the ceiling and off of the back wall and off of the side walls of the performance space can give your ear a real sense of spaciousness in terms of depth and height, even though we don't literally have a specific signal reproducing that. I'd like to finish up with maybe the most important point guiding you in terms of thinking about putting together a stereo system that works well. And I think this is going to surprise you a little bit, Lance, but Okay. Hang with me and see if I can explain this. So there is a tendency, I can understand it, I think it's just intuitive, to assume that some of the uh, sound that gives this feeling of spaciousness, depth and height especially, comes from the sound of the stereo, the speakers, reflecting off the walls in the room where you're actually listening to your stereo. And that is basically not how it works. So let me say that again. It's not a matter of your speakers reflecting off of the walls. There could be a small component of that, but the main thing that leads to this sense of particularly depth and height is that when the recording is made, the reflections in the actual recording venue, that could be a club, that could be a concert hall, it could also be a recording studio, but whatever reflections there are or aren't are recorded and you can hear that and your ear interprets those reflections the same way it would as if they were happening in your room. And so the more accurately the reflections are recorded, the more the stereo reproduces that sense of spaciousness, which your ear brain combination understands. So just to repeat that, the sense of spaciousness is largely not because of the sound from the speakers reflecting off of your walls. It's largely a matter of the reflections being recorded in the original recording space, and then your ear-brain combination senses what that is like. And that's often why live recordings sound more spacious than ones made in a studio, because in a studio we've got sound absorbers and stuff and we're trying to isolate the musicians. Whereas sure. live, we're in a, you know, the Fillmore, God rest its soul, <laughs> or Carnegie Hall, or uh, some large recording, or... Uh, I forget the exact name of the venue where they played but uh an epic recording for me growing up was acdc live and a perfect example if you look at the intro of uh thunderstruck very classic riff but if you listen to the studio version it just sounds like perfect almost like you're in a closet like you're right there sitting beside angus yeah. in a studio yeah. and then acdc live it's just this huge stadium and then even to take it a step further, our boy Jimmy here, if you think of that Woodstock recording yeah, with uh, yeah. Star Spangled Banner, he's not even in a stadium. You're just out in a field and you can just hear, uh, or in that case, maybe the lack thereof of... of what um, you also, I think, sometimes notice in like Woodstock or other recordings like that is you're picking up 
the sense of the crowd mm -hmm. and whatever noises are happening in the space just gives you that sense of ambience. Because you so, take him doing the Star Spangled Banner out in the field, there is other live recordings of him doing it in small clubs in New York City, and just that spatial yeah, feel is like different. perfect. Yeah, it sounds different. Very different. So, yeah. Lance and I aren't trying to say that studio recordings are bad and live recordings are good. The point I'm trying to make is that the sense of sound staging uh, depth and height, particularly is often easier to hear there because the recording venue has long decay times and you really get a sense of there being a large space there. So, sound staging is very important for a sense of realism. Remember, we're trying to uh, reproduce what we call the absolute sound, the sound of live music as intended by the artists in a real space, so obviously that sense of spaciousness is important and we want to have a high level of fidelity to what the artist's intent was and to do that we want to record the sense of space just like we want to record the frequencies that are being reproduced. So that takes us through uh, the first six of our top ten ways to judge sound quality and we'll be back in episode four to talk about the last four components of judging sound quality and yeah I think these will be not too surprising once we put them together with frequency response and sound staging but uh, they're a little bit different and special, and they're kind of that, I'm going to say some of it is the secret sauce of stereo equipment. All right, thank you, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks, everyone.